Okay, hello everybody and welcome to today's event. I'm Jason Gumpert from msdynamicsworld.com and I'm pleased to welcome everyone to today's session all about making your AX solution run faster. Uh, as, as we get started here, um, just a couple of notes before I hand it off to, uh, to our presenters. Uh, first, we do welcome your questions today. Please do look for the Q&A block. Uh, that you see to the right of the main presentation area. You can enter questions in there anytime, and I know that uh, our presenters, Kim Tamantri and Steve Walsh, will be making time uh, to take those questions during the session. And, and uh, we also want to keep things interactive. And in, an, in another way, the, uh, uh, the presenters also just wanted to get a little bit of feedback from you um, on your own experiences and kind of what, where you're coming from. Uh, so we have a couple poll questions here that I'm going to uh, open up uh, as we get started, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, taking a moment to answer those, that would be great. So without any further delay, uh, I think we're ready to begin. I'm going to hand things off to uh, Kim Tamantri to um, start things off. Thank you, Jason. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining today. My name is Kim Tamantri. I am the sales manager for HS Advantage Services in North America. I work alongside Steve Walsh, who will be presenting today. I uh, just wanted to share a little bit of background on HSO, and uh, I will have Steve move to the next slide real quick here. There we go. So HSO is a global company. We have well over 600 employees, and uh, as a Microsoft partner, we do primarily focus on, on AX Dynamics 365 products. On to the next slide, you will see that we do have a few referenceable uh, multiple industries. You may recognize some of these names as well. And as for today's agenda, we will be reviewing SQL and AOS settings that are common for best performance, uh, explore specific settings, how they should be set, review the tools that can be used to find the settings uh, and to help improve performance, and we'll finish off with a Q&A session. And then to introduce you to Steve Walsh, who will be presenting today. He is our Director of Managed Services for HSO North America. He does have a developer background, uh, working with ERP solutions since 1997 and Dynamics AX since 2005. Steve, I'll hand this over to you. Thanks, Kim. Well, welcome, everybody. And um, hopefully I can keep this topic, which is somewhat of a, of a dry topic. The good thing is it's it has a lot of uh, a lot of different things that you can go and, and use to, to check your servers. Um, so, so the first section here, just want to cover up some assumptions, and then we're going to dive into the, the SQL Server settings, uh, the AOS servers, and then some maintenance pieces, and some user features, and then at the end, I have a link or several links for some resources for you. So, uh, we do have an ability to share the the slides um, for you, so you can you can take notes, or you can just sit back and listen and uh, and absorb it all, because uh, we'll we'll give these slides out to those um, that that want a copy of it. So a couple a couple of things before we get started into the into the assumptions is the the factors that affect performance. So real quick, that there's you know there's no silver bullet for improving um, performance. You have to kind of look at it, and I have an onion there on the screen, and, and it's many layers. So as as we start to peel back the onion, each layer is, is a different problem or a different solution, or different different things that we need to look at. And so today we're going to kind of go over the different layers that you might be dealing with. Uh, but then one of the main layers that we we're going to cover is is the basics of the of the settings. So here's here's some of the, the the different factors and some of the layers. So you have the hardware layer, which is going to be your physical layer, it's your server boxes, your network bandwidth, uh, storages, storage devices, or even some of your client machines. And um, for the most part, you should be at at the minimum uh, working with the Microsoft recommended uh, requirements. Most most of the time, when I see those the hardware is not an issue. Most most of the customers that we deal with, they have plenty of servers, plenty of memory, plenty of disk space, generally not the hardware. 
uh, or if, and if, if there is something there, they're pretty quick to add on a, a virtual machine or, or increase the, the settings there. Uh, configuration, Windows configuration is, an, is a layer there that, that does come into play. For the most part, what we see around those are the antivirus and the firewalls that kind of get in the way. It's not necessarily the operating system. I think most IT groups are pretty good about keeping that up, up to speed. The antivirus, the word of caution around that is to make sure that you have um, segregated out of the, the SQL server so that all those ins and outs that are talking from the AOS server to the SQL server, your, your antivirus is not checking those. Uh, and then the SQL server configuration. So this, this is what we're going to cover a bunch today. And it's the application layer, the, the actual SQL uh, software running on that server. And then once you get inside the SQL, then they have some database schema indexes. A little bit of us with this, but not, a, not too much. Uh, that, that's another layer that we can get into with a performance review. Uh, but this, what we're going to cover today is some settings that you can go, go look, make sure that the SQL is set correctly, and then on the AOS, we're going to make sure that some of those um, settings are, are set correctly as well. And these are the settings that we're going to cover are, are recommendations and things that we've seen in the past. Uh, one, of, one of the roles I've had in the past is I used to work for Microsoft as a premier field engineer uh, and a TAM. And a lot of these things were some of the issues that we saw early on in, in the 2009 and the 2012 days of, of AX. Application configuration, so these are or your application, application code. So if you have uh, the kernel and the application code, those are the things that we're going to talk there. ISV code, so if you have IS, ISV layers that are coming in effect. And then, of course, customizations and then different query calls. That's, that's around the application code. And then the application configuration is uh, the, the items inside AX. So parameter settings, sequence numbers, you got database logging turned on. Uh, and the last part, which becomes a big part, which a lot of people don't realize, is the user or the business process. So it, it's not just always the system, but sometimes it's it's the person touching the keyboard that's causing issues. So uh, we'll kind of get into all these different scenarios. I've seen a lot of different things come up. And uh, I can say that there's certainly a lot of creative users out there. So some key assumptions. So the first assumption I already mentioned is that uh, we're going to assume that your hardware is at least the recommended level, or it's bigger. Like I said before, most of the time we get in there, customers have uh, several servers running their AX system, and it's not necessarily that the hardware sizing is an issue. It's more of configuring those those servers correctly. What we're going to cover is it's it's technical, um, it's it's dry. Uh, I, I, what I did is I. I went through and put some pictures in there. So maybe the, the pictures, if when we're talking on, on a specific topic, uh, maybe the, what you see for the picture might be a little bit of a humor. So kind of pay attention to the pictures and see how that ties into what we're talking. I'm not necessarily going to point it out every time, but <laughs> maybe my dry humor can, can help alleviate some, some of the blandness of the topic. So um, the other thing I wanted to, to make sure that um, when you are looking at these settings that you do have access to those, you know how to pull them up. I'm not going to get into like all the different SQL tools that you can use to, to check the settings. That's something that if, if you really don't have that or know what that is, you probably shouldn't be looking at those settings anyways and get somebody that should help you. The other thing we want to make sure is that you should, re you should really consult your Microsoft partner before you make changes. Make sure that these the suggested changes that we're, we're suggesting are in line with your settings. Everybody has a, a variety. Um, every customer is unique. Every data segment is unique. So just make sure that your what you're changing is is correct um, for your situation. And then before you do anything in production, of course, always, 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 always test it in your test environment. Um, if, if I've seen hot fixes from Microsoft blow up. Uh, production, so you want to make sure you're even any hot fixes you get from Microsoft, you're testing that in a test environment, not not affecting any production that you may um, be concerned about. Okay, the other assumption is, um, like Kim had mentioned, I am a director of managed services. I do have a developer background and a technical background. I am removed from the day-to-day -day, um, pieces of this, so if you have a, a question. 
uh, that that later on that we get into. Um, I've seen a lot, but I haven't seen everything, so there may be a couple questions that you guys pose that we may have to get back to you. So, uh, but feel free to to put those questions in the in the uh, chat box, and uh, Kim and Jason will will manage those for us. Okay, so let's get into the the SQL Server settings. First one we have is is the production SQL Server. So many times when I go into a customer site, uh, what I will find is we get into uh, the, the looking at the SQL databases, and I will actually find some dev databases, test databases, or other databases that are not necessarily associated with AX, but they're also not associated with production. So what one of the first things you want to do is make sure your production environment is completely segregated from any of the test, UAT, or dev environments. And that, that also includes any uh, applications that may not be AX, but they're using that SQL production. Make sure it's all production type uh, activity that's on there. I think it's obvious. If you got a developer and he writes the wrong set of code, you certainly don't want that affecting your production from a performance standpoint. So um, segregate that. Seems obvious, but I can tell you I've, I've walked into several customer accounts and have found this situation. Uh, SQL Server should be configured to run in the background. So there's, I gave the, the pathing to find that setting in, on SQL. Um, you can re reference back this, but it's always good to have it running in the background. Next one is your configure your max degree of parallelism. Uh, this should be set to 1. And on the screen, I've given the, the command. Uh, so if you get into your SQL Server, you can run this command to, to set that up correctly. The max um, server memory. So this, this is really important from an operating standpoint. So you need to leave your operating system, um, leave them about 10% or 4 gigabytes of memory, just so the operating system can operate. SQL Server is set up to grab as much memory as it's as is available, and if you don't segregate this out, it'll actually use up, when, and your operating system won't have enough space to actually run. So that could that could be the problem, not necessarily SQL. So there's my first first picture of of kind of that joke leaving a little bit for the operating system to eat. Okay, so dry hammer. <laughs> okay, some SQL settings. So the temp Temp DB. There, for every core on your SQL Server, you can have a temp file. So that, so you want to have those separate. So if you have four cores, then you'll have temp uh, four temp uh, data files. Also, set these up to be about 20% of your entire database size. So if it's you know if your database is 100 uh, gigs, then make sure you're saving 20 gigs for your uh, temporary database. Um, and then make sure that they're, those files are the same size. And we'll, on the next screen, we'll talk about some of the trace flags. But uh, we, we definitely want those to be, the, the temp database files should be similar size. Um, they, you know, you shouldn't have them, they shouldn't be really off. So kind of take a look at those, make sure that they're, they're set correctly. Set the, the simple recover model, uh, or set those to a simple recover model. And then the auto growth, this is, a, this is kind of a fallback. Um, the auto growth to be between 250 megs to 500 megs. But I, the, the next bullet point there with it being um, set to a one gig start is, is recommended. So one of the things with uh, the, the temp DB is you don't, want that to kick into auto growth all the time. Uh, it, should be, it should be something that during a maintenance period that you go actually and check to make sure it's you know, meeting that 20%. And if you need to grow it, grow it then during a maintenance window. Um, the auto growth setting is more of a fallback, just in case you have something that, that causes your temp your, your attempt to, to grow faster than what it's, what it's set for. So when, it does go, when SQL kicks into auto growth, what it does is it locks down all activity on SQL. And so you know, 
know, kind of think about that. You don't necessarily want SQL to be shutting down to, to grow your, your temp files. Um, so, so that's something you kind of have to look at, at, you know, the balance there of what size your temp DB is and uh, making sure that it's the right percentage. But also have the auto growth on there so that just in case you do hit that, it, it will kick in and not lock up. Okay, so trace flags. These, um, as, as I've gone through the different years working with AX, this list has gone from zero to one to, to three and then up to the, to the five of the recommended. So these are something you can query on your, on your SQL box and, and find the flags if they're enabled. There is a setting where it's, uh, it's, it's a permanent setting versus uh, a session setting. So you kind of want to make pay attention to to those that once you log off, you don't want that to, to be reset for your session, that you're setting it for the actual server. So the first one is 1117. This flag grows all file groups simultaneously in the case of an auto growth. So if your auto growth kicks in, you want to make sure that all those temp files are, are growing at the same time. 4199 activates the query optimizer. Uh, so this was this had some hot fixes that came through, and this kind of helps with those hot fixes. So we want to make sure that those are enabled. 4136, this is actually disabled, so it's a parameter sniffing. So this is when when AI, when the SQL Server is trying to be um, smarter than AX, and it's trying to see what kind of parameters you're you're sending down the pipe, and and try to anticipate what's what's going to uh, be called. Turning this off helps AX actually do a little bit more, more of its job than having SQL do the, um, try, try to do some thinking for AX, and that's kind of the contentions that we have. We see a lot is AX is built a certain way and SQL is built a different way, and they don't necessarily agree on on how to present or look for data. So some of these settings are set for the best performance. The 1224 enabled lock escalation. So the number of locks, so locking and blocking in SQL is normal. You just have to figure out which one is a healthy one and which one is not a healthy one. And over the time that the, that the SQL engine or the support engineers have determined that, that there should be an, a lock escalation, and this 20 or 1224 enables that process to, to occur. 2371, uh, it's it's a unique one, but it's one that does come up. Uh, more so with uh, small tables. So there may be a table that gets uh, um, the statistics don't necessarily get updated for those that size table. And so if you have uh, a lot of data that's changing, the statistics on that table doesn't necessarily get uh, gets changed. So what this one does, the enablement of that, actually lowers it down to that 25,000 row. So it's uh, something that, that has helped with some of those smaller tables that, that are getting updated, but the statistics are not getting auto-updated. Okay, so uh, another setting just to have set to true is the read committed snapshot, snapshot isolation. And then the auto create stats. So we talked about statistics. So statistics are going to help with your query plans. And if a statistic is cert one certain way, SQL is going to say, hey, let's let continue to use this this plan. But as your statistics get updated, it may decide that a different plan is more efficient. So that's why you want to have those statistics kind of continually be updated. Uh, disk I/O the the key here um, is to be using a RAID system. Now, what's best? What's the best RAID system for you? Is, that's something that your DBA needs to kind of look at and evaluate how much data you have and how much processing you have. Um, but the key for these things is your reads and writes need to be less than what's specified on the screen, 10, 10 milliseconds and 20 milliseconds. Um, I'm not an expert on the, on the disk RAID system. I just know that when if someone is not using a RAID system, their system is re really struggling to, to keep up with everything. Okay, so we're getting to the, to the end of the SQL settings. And, and a lot of the things that happen with the SQL settings is just 
continually maintenance of it. So we want to have uh, the, the, the indexing to be on a periodic basis, so the continue updates of, of the indexing. So you can find this inside AX um, under administration, periodic, and go to SQL administration. There's You can pick actually pick a table and, and run the re-indexing, or you can re-index the entire table. Uh, statistics rebuilding, there, this is a command on SQL Server that you can have your statistics rebuild. It, it's, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, every day, but uh, at least a once a week type of rebuild. Uh, again, the statistics is going to help SQL Server determine which query plan is best for, you, for your system. So if, you have, if you're doing a lot of migration or a lot of data importing, you know, it might be a good idea to go ahead and update statistics after shortly after that. I've, I have seen where a company did a huge import on their inventory. Uh, they had the, the engineering group create a bunch of new item parts for a new bill of material, update several hundred items into AX, and then the following, um, the following week, they, they did that on, on the weekend and, and Monday and Tuesday the following week, they were trying to get their MRP to run, but their MRP was the way that some of those calculations work. Sometimes it goes through that dimension combo table, and not all those dimensions are built out yet. So it was trying to trying to do a query plan based off of dimension. And um, if they had run some statistic updates, that cleared out the statistics and enforced SQL to use the AX query versus coming up with, with its own plan. So just some things to think about when, you, when you're doing your statistics and rebuilding, and if you've got a lot of import coming, um, think about your statistics and how SQL is going to interpret that. So uh, what I have listed on the screen is some tables and some sizes to, to take a look at. Uh, so you have the invent, invent settlement table, the event CU, um, CUD table, some log tables there. Um, they, these are all temporary tables that get used at different times. And sometimes, for whatever reason, that AX doesn't necessarily clean these out very well. So you may have to clean these out. Uh, in the maintenance part of this presentation, we actually dive in a little bit deeper on the, on the periodics of cleaning out different tables and stuff. But these are just a quick list of things to kind of do a quick check to see what the size of those tables are. If you, if you see a, a table, you know, 500 records or a million records, and it's one of these tables, um, you might want to investigate that a little bit. Okay, so I have a SQL Server, and we'll dive into the AOS. So that these these are just the AOS settings to have. So you know, memory no less than 16 gigs. Having one AOS uh, server instance on a server box. So making sure that you you don't have um, trying to have that server do multiple things. Um, you know, break break those apart. Uh, Breakpoints. Breakpoints need to be disabled. So th this this is one that we see over and over with customers that they will have their breakpoints turned on inside their production system. And what that does, regardless if you if you're using a debugger or not, uh, the AOS will force. AX to go into a single thread mode. So any multi-threading that you may have set up gets canceled by having your breakpoints enabled in, in those products. So for production, go disable all your breakpoints, all your debugging features in production, um, and do all your test, all your debugging in test and dev, not in production. And if you need to do something over there, I would, you know, recommendation is to actually refresh one of the other environments and do your debugging over there. But if you need to go do your debugging, make sure you turn off that, that breakpoint piece uh, when you're done. Uh, max buffer size, so set that between 24 and 48. Uh, for, for the R2s out there, your, your default is 48. Uh, max number of tables to join, so the maximum is 30. Again, think, you know, some of these, um, some of the customizations that we see, that they can get some pretty crazy joins on there. So this just sets up as a, as a 30. Entire table cache size, so this is set to 90, 96. So the 96 tables that are being, being cached. Again, it's all about memory management at this point. Uh, global object cache elements is set to 100,000. And then state, 
statement cache is set to 450. So a lot, of, a lot around the memory management and enforcing the AOS to you know, go get the, the next one instead of holding it onto memory. And then the a max memory setting should be set to uh, 80%, so leaving 20% for your operating system to, to function. And then the dedicated AOS for batch. So at a minimum, uh, you should have, for your production, you should have two AOSs, one for users to log in and one for everything else, Bat your batch jobs, um, if you have, if you're running um, Roll Center or SSRS, try to segregate all that other stuff away from the users so that the user's experience is, is the best and the non-UI um, type activity is, is being taken on with a different type of batch. Now, if you do get into uh, multiple AOSs, and, and a lot of companies have uh, more, more of like an AOS farm, then you can actually set up batch uh, batch job type groups where you can segregate certain jobs that are on batches to run on three or four AOS servers and a different set of uh, batch jobs on a different set. So you can have the accounting folks doing one thing and the production folks doing a different thing and not affecting each other's um, evening jobs. So that was the AOS things, very, very clean. I know there's, there's probably a lot of questions around AOSs, but it's a very simple thing once you understand what's, what's going on there, and they're, you know, certainly can have AOS farms as well. So, um, Okay, so maintenance. So kernel. One of, the, one of the first things, if you call into Microsoft to get, to, to get some help, one of the first things that they're going to ask you is, are you on the latest kernel? So always keep that, you know, go out and check. Uh, the kernel updates to see if you're on the latest kernel, get those updated. When you do an update for a kernel, you need to have that kernel matched everywhere. So your client, your AOS, the SQL server, um, any other locations that may have a, a kernel installed, all those need to have the same version. Now one of the, one of the trick parts of this is we do have customers that they get the new kernel, they do want to, they, they're doing the right thing, they want to test it out, they put it in their test environment. Uh, but one of the things that they, they're challenged with is testing that kernel fairly quick. And, and the reason I say it is because most of the time your client that your users are using, are gonna, it's going to be the same client that touches the test AOS and the production AOS, and those two may not be on the same, the client may not have the same kernel number if you're testing one, right? So, so it needs to be kind of done, your testing needs to be kind of done quickly if you're using, installing a kernel um, and get those out to all the different machines that have, uh, that needs the update, okay? That's, and that's, that's another area that we see a lot of times. So if you're dealing with AOS crashing, this is an area where you need to go check to see if there's a, an AOS or a, a client that's using the wrong, um, the wrong version. That's generally a, lot, a big contributor to AOS crashes. Okay. Keep in mind when you do a kernel update, it is not tied to the app, the application layer. So it's not, it's not a KB that you're downloading and having to merge a bunch of code. It's, it's the executable code that's lying underneath everything. All right, monthly checks. Uh, so, so part of the monthly checks is you know check your database logs. So, database logging, you know, it's a feature. I see it turned on in many many customers' accounts. Some do it correctly, and a lot do it incorrectly. The correct way of doing the database logging is on tables that are not transactional type tables. So if you have, if you want to keep track of what the changes are on a vendor card, an employee card, a customer card, um, and, and sometimes the inventory data, that that's okay. What we don't want to see on the logging is uh, tracking for purchase orders, sales orders, inventory transfers, any type of transactions. And if just so you kind of think about what's going on, you're 
a lot of times people turn on the inserts, deletes, and updates on these, but every time a transaction happens, the database log has to go and check to see if it's a if it's something that needs to log. If it is, then it goes log, you know, logs the the old record information and the new record information, and that can build out pretty quick. So just kind of keep an eye on that. Now, if you do have it turned on, you need to kind of keep an eye on the size. If you have, you know, there's kind of a rule of thumb, and you kind of decide what what level of record you want to keep. But if you have 200,000 records in your database log, are, is that information useful? And that's what you kind of have to decide is, you know, if it's, if it's six-month-old data, a year-old data, are you, do you really need to have that information? So you, you, it's something that you need to figure out. Um, each customer is different. They're, they're tracking the, the changes for a particular reason. It may be a situation where you may want to do an archive and move that data off to something else. Okay, so that you can use the export import tools to, to do the archiving. And then to clean it up, to get some stuff out of there, that gave you the path uh, to, to move that stuff off there. So just be careful with database log. It's a useful tool when it's used correctly. It can, it can kill your performance if you're not using it correctly. Okay, so the next, next couple things that we're going to talk about are just, they're tables that are, are used during the processing. And for some reason, different reasons, maybe it's the system went down at a particular time, or you know, maybe you had a, uh, uh, a version of the software that didn't have an update and it caused data to, to go into these tables, and you just need to clean it out. Uh, I, you don't see it a whole lot in 2012, but certainly the 2009 version. Um, these these tables did get get some messy junk in there that you need to go and clean. So the, the temporary sales order and purchase order processing data. So I have some queries here for the sales pram line and purchase pram line. Take a look at those. If it's you know a large number, you may want to decide to go ahead and clean those out. Again, I give the path here, but there's really no reason to keep keep data in there over a month. It's it's just processing. Um, so it's temporary temporary data that's going in and out of these tables. Master planning. So this is a big um, calculation thing, right? So a lot of times, if you, especially if you have AOS crashing or if, you're, if your MRP is not finishing correctly, there, there are times where data gets stuck in this invent some log. There's, it's okay to have a couple, you know, a small number in there, but it, it should be a small number. If you've got hundreds and thousands of records in there, that's something you probably want to take a look at and, and do a clearing. The normal process for this table is at the beginning of the MRP process, it, it's supposed to go out there and clear out anything that it doesn't need. So if you've if you got a lot in there, then I would you know, probably kind of take a look at what's, what's going on in there and maybe, maybe clean it out. Okay, so we're, now we went from monthly checks to quarterly checks. So sales line. These are, uh, basically these are records that can build up and you may want to move these, move these out. Um, you know, once, once the sales order is processed, it, it actually turns into an invoice. So, you know, you got to figure out what, what makes sense to keep. A lot of customers turn on, um, they, they turn on a, a parameter to set it so it doesn't necessarily delete the record, but it changes it to voided, and, and AX knows how to handle the, the query on there, and so it moves the moves the, the tables over to a voided table. So look at this one. It, you know, you, again, it's a personal preference on it if you want to keep these records or not, um, but it's something that you know if you've got several years, especially in the 2009 scenario, uh, you may want to do some archiving and then clear out what you have in, in production. Does it make sense to have something that's uh, from um, you know eight nine years ago. Okay, another one is inventory settlement. So this is this stores temporary data during the inventory close. Uh, so uh, as you go through the inventory closing process, if there's junk data in this table, it will cause your inventory closing to take a little bit longer. So kind of look through here and see if it's something that you can clean up. Uh, the, the idea is 
for this one is more of a finance, you know, looking at the financial years. Do you need do you need to have something from a previous financial year or, or several financial years? So kind of look at the data and see what's in there and make a decision if, if it's data that you need to have in there or not. Okay, batch jobs. And this is one of those couple of humor uh, pictures. <laughs> Okay, so how do we, and, and to wake everybody up from the, the dryness of this topic. So batch job. So no, no batch job um, with reoccurrence of every minute. So think about that. You got you got checking for invoices. You're gathering all the invoices that need to be processed. Do you want to have that job cranking out every minute? Um, probably not because it probably takes just about a minute for that process to run. So spread that out to maybe five minutes or, or an hour or whatever that threshold is. But the key here is not to have it within a minute because a lot of times the batch jobs can't get kicked off and started before the, the, the following reoccurrence starts wants to kick off. And so they get kind of hung up on themselves. So I uh, haven't seen this one in a long time, but, you know, every once in a while somebody gets ambitious about how often they want their batch jobs. So kind of keep an eye on that. Um, you know, three three to five minutes is probably a safer one for more of those frequent runs that you may have. And then use the batch job groups and time the schedule. So this this is one that I um, you don't think a lot about this unless you're a large organization and moving a lot of information around. But there are times where you may have a couple of different jobs that are hitting the same table at the, uh, for different reasons at the same table and, and they may clobber each other. So uh, you may want to move those jobs and look at the scheduling of when the, you know, the average time that job runs and when the next one starts and segregate those out a little bit on your, on your timeline to make sure that they all have a chance to, to perform at a, at a efficient manner. Take a look at when your backups are running. I've seen a lot of times where backups are running at you know, kicks off at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and then at midnight, backups are not quite done yet, and MRP kicks off. So um, those two contentions will, uh, will will slow each other down. It'll either slow down the backups or it'll slow down MRP, and then MRP isn't done when you come in in the, the next morning and uh, your, your production folks are wondering what the heck happened. Okay, so reports is another area that you need to look at as far as what's, what's going on with the system. This is a classic case of the morning where everybody comes in around 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and then uh, you know the system is really slow between 9 and 10.30. And nobody knows why, but it's always slow in the morning. Well, generally what, ha what you find is there's that one user that comes in and he runs a huge report that does lots of calculations kicks it off, and he knows it takes a while to run the report, so he kicks off and he goes and refreshes his coffee or heads over and checks on maybe uh, what the warehouse is doing. Um, so it's not necessarily affecting him because he's, he's utilizing the time, but it's affecting everybody else. So in this case, you need, you need to kind of look at what, what reports are being run in the morning. Do they need to be run in the morning? Can you set them up so that they run at night and are published to a SharePoint site so that folks, when they come in, they have the data that they need. And do the other question that I would ask folks is, the data that they're looking at, how much of that has changed from the previous time that they ran it? So a lot of times I, someone just runs a report because that was what they were told to run every morning. Uh, but it only changes a small fraction. And maybe there's a different report that they need to be looking at versus a, a long major report that cranks out two to 300 pages. So those are things that you kind of need to look at, but we've seen a lot of reports affect the system. Um, another thing that to kind of look at doing is segregating your reporting server from your production server. So perhaps using the backup database or a cutover ba database um, as the reporting mechanism. And if that's synced up fairly well with your SQL servers, uh, you can actually get some, some decent data out of there. It all depends on the data that they're trying to pull and how, how refreshed does that data need to be. Okay. Here's a, uh, another 
um, it's kind of a monthly thing that you probably should do. So most, most is a consistency check. So a lot of times when you're doing the implementation, the consistency checks come into play after data migration. And what we're finding is that you should be running the consistency checks on a more frequent basis. And a lot of times uh, customers don't realize is that there are da there's data that is being imported. And then the other thing that causes bad data is some customizations. So, the, so sometimes when customizations are written, or even on ISB solution, there's a link that's missing, or uh, it has a bad query or something, and it just causes the, the data to get disconnected. So consistency check is going to check to make sure that all the, all the related tables are connected, and, and it has what it needs to, um, to present the data correctly. So if you think about how SQL uses the joins, if there's something missing on joins, you'll either get the wrong data or you, it may cause SQL to go into a total, uh, a full table scan um, when it does its query plan to, to pull up what it's looking for. So running consistency check on a regular basis can help fill some of that stuff. And it also can identify potentially where maybe a customization is having some issues. So if, if for some reason you run consistency check and it times out before you get any errors, then that's most likely going to be because there's a lot of errors popping into your info log, and the info log uh, hit its max. And if that happens, you need you need to get a developer in there to help customize that that uh, info log. Um, you know, perhaps only only reporting on unique errors or um, dumping that info log. Um, you know, but once it hits the max, dump the info log to a to a file, and then let it you know let it continue. So there's some some different creative things that they can get into to, to help with that. Okay, so if you haven't run your consistency checks, that might be something you want to do. I'd recommend that you run that in test first because that can, if you haven't done it in a while, it could uh, it could show up a lot of um, things, and then you're running it in production could cause some performance hits. So just kind of be careful when you run that first time, run it in that test environment. All right, so here's another uh, tip uh, that we have come across and seen. And it's been a while, but it's one definitely uh, to to revisit. So it's the GUID. And this is the unique identifier for each environment. So each uh, in SQL, there is a, a unique identifier for uh, for logging into the server. So your production, your test, your dev, they all should have unique identifiers. And what happens, What generally what we see uh, is um, companies will copy their production data over to the dev environment. They don't change, you know, they don't change the GUID. And when a user logs in, to the dev environment and then switches over to production, there's some information that's stored on their client side that kind of keeps track of usage data, cache data, and with the GUID being the same, the system doesn't know which environment you're coming or going from. So it can cause performance issues. I've seen it cause performance issues, um, and but the main big one is it causes that uh, issue where the user needs to go clear their their usage data, and it has to be the full clearing of usage data, not just one little item. So clearing this out um, as you you don't do production as you copy production to either your test or dev environments, you clear it out in those test and dev environments, and then when you launch the AOS and someone logs in it, the system will create a new GUID number. So all you have to do is actually clear that field out, and it's and it's uh, it'll take care of itself. So there are uh, the, the table is there. You can do a query on it, take a look at what's there. And it should be self-explanatory. Uh, but there are a couple blogs out there that that talk about it as well. Okay, so we're getting into some user features. So those that are waiting for um, that that are not necessarily in the IT, but our users want to know what they can do. This is uh, the section that you've been waiting for. So. In NAX, there are these things called fax boxes and preview panes. In many cases, they're useful. In a lot of cases, they're just things on the screen. So if you're not using them, turn them off. 
what AX does is it, you know the ones on especially the ones on the uh, the right hand side of the screen those are calculations so what AX is going to do is it's going to pull another query it's going to do some calculations and display the information if you turn off those boxes AX is just going to show the grid and it's going to um, not do those extra steps so saving some time it'll actually bring up that screen a lot faster to turn these off look for the little button up in the right hand corner we've got a picture of it um, and then it's called the fax boxes if there's a checkbox next to it it's enabled and then you can see the different the different versions of you can just show them all off or be specific okay so there's there's a couple ways if you you could go user by user and shut them off so you know if your accountants want certain ones on they they can do that and if your production people want them all off uh, they can go do that and so the production people have a faster machine than the accountants um, from an IT perspective you guys may want to shut them off from a all up there is a system wide parameter um, but that shuts it all off for all fax boxes and all preview panes for the entire system so that may not be the best option if you want it to be segregated by specific screen or by specific form then you gotta get a developer to get in there and, and turn those off for each specific uh, screen okay. so this one's uh, main, more for the 2009 I don't know if I've ever seen it on a 2012 or if, we've, if we're just getting smarter as we go through the versions but the favorites so what I've seen users do is they they like to have their uh, their grid set up with a different filter uh, sort order and so they'll go set those up and then they'll set it up as a favorite and not realizing that they're causing AX to do a, t a full table scan or um, some query that it wasn't you know, not necessarily designed for and so it worked fine for a while but once you start building up some of that some of that data then it starts to slow down so a lot of times it's it's their favorites you need to go figure out um, and the only way I've come across this one is when I'm standing over someone's shoulder and I ask them to, to show me how they think the system is performing slow and they go right over to the favorites and open it up and I go okay <laughs> let's go a different route <laughs> and, and then that's how we figured that one out so um, kind of keep that in mind if it's one one user that's kind of complaining about the system being slow uh, you might want to just go over and see how they access that particular form and, and um, kind of keep an eye on if they're using favorites or not. Okay, usage data. So there's strange results, seen some strange performance issues, nothing that makes a whole lot of sense. Most likely it's their user, da user usage data. If it's in a, if they're having specific issues in a particular form or running a specific report, you can actually go into the usage data form and the options and kind of narrow it down to that specific area. If it's sales or if it's purchasing, go into that specific area and, and, and delete those specific components. That's the best way because otherwise, you're gonna the what I call the nuclear option is to clear all their usage data, and when you do that, you wipe out all the users personal preferences that they may have set up over the over the months may be a good thing in some cases but most likely they're not going to be too happy that they got to go redo everything um, so if you can try to narrow it down with the usage data and go and clear it um, by specific form or report in a specific area that'll probably be a lot better than than having them go clear the usage data for for everything so kind of keep that in mind try to keep your users happy um, we don't want any any sad faces okay and the last part is is resources as we finish up here so um, one of one of the things that that I just went over is specific to the settings of your SQL server your AOS servers some of the settings inside AX some of the maintenance stuff so it's all easy stuff simple stuff to help with that you may still be may be experiencing some slowness what that's going to be is more around your indexes and long-running queries. And if that's the case, the best way to, have, to figure out what's going on there is to have a performance review. And the performance review is going to use, uh, it's going to look at how AX is calling the SQL queries and how the SQL is 
interpreting those queries and what plans it's using. It may be as simple as adding a couple indexes or fixing a few indexes. It may require for a developer to get in there and rewrite a query to make it work the way that it needs to work. Um, you know, again, think about Microsoft. They, they've got lots of customers in a lot of different industries, and you know, they try to try to get a majority of the users correct, but not every situation is is figured out. So you may be using the the system in a unique way with unique data that requires a different index than what was anticipated. So again, testing on your system with 100 records, it's going to work out great, but as soon as you put in 100,000 or a million records, you're going to see a performance um, issue with all the queries that are going on, and especially if you're doing a table scan. A lot of you guys have DBAs, and I've seen some great DBAs without tra AX training. And the best thing you can do for your DBA is to get them into AX training. There's specific performance tuning classes that you can get, um, have your DBA go through. And this is where the bigger piece of that onion is going to be. So they're going to run, um, look at those performance tools and the performance reviews, and they're going to start tweaking the indexes and start tweaking the queries. And then a different query is going to show that it's not running great. So you, they start working on the top five, top ten um, issues. Once they get those running, then the next top five, top ten will become their targets. And over time, as things go, you can actually have a, a, a very um, efficient and fast-performing system. Even an AX2009 um, can be running very fast if you've got that DBA who's trained and knows how to tune the, the database the right way through AX. So keep that in mind. Um, if this is something that you're not, you know, if you're, if you're if you'd like to have performance review or some performance tuning done, and it's you know your your partner is not able to provide that, um, reach out to myself or Kim. We can we can give you some recommendations, um, or we can we can set that up as a service as well for you. So, on the resource screen that I put here, I, I have uh, an article about the storage. I'm not mentioned to you. I'm not a RAID guy, so uh, I put the article in here so you can read on that. I put the performance page, so this is from, coming from Microsoft, and the PFEs that are out there, they, they're constantly putting different articles out there. Um, so both both those and that performance analyzer tool that your DBA should be using, I, I put the link there for them as well. Okay. So we're coming up on about 52 minutes into the hour, 53 minutes into the hour, and so we're at that Q&A time. Thank you, Steve. We do have a few questions here that came through. So we'll start off with the first question here that came from Jeff. Um, he has a question uh, asking, is the temporary database uh, sizing per file, or is it in total? It, 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 it's, it's on the SQL Server. So when you, when you go to um, SQL Server, it's going to be looking at that, that, um, the temp files. And that's that's what you got to look at. Okay. And I will go to the next one here that came through. Uh, this one is asking where. Where can they check the AOS settings? Okay. So you'll. You're wanting to get onto the AOS server, and on there in an administrative tools, there should be, uh, I think it's the Dynamics Configuration Server. It'll have the it'll have configuration in the title of your program. Once you go in there, then you'll you'll see all types of AOS settings, different tabs, and what the specific AOS you're working with. And if that's confusing, okay. reach out to me, and we can <laughs> we can do a screen share, and I can walk you through it. <laughs> oh, yeah, and we can definitely follow follow up with um with uh, answers to these questions via email as well. So, um, we've got another question from Luther. So he's asking, is there a point of diminishing returns in regards to the number of AOS servers? For example, how many is too many? Um. 
I would think that there may be. I've seen 36 AOSs on a system, and I don't think that company is utilizing all those servers. So it all depends on what you have running and how fast your system is running. There is some threading that you can set up inside AX to utilize those servers a little bit better, uh, but it all, it's all depending on what you're going to do. Um, I, I think if you, you get to a certain point where adding one more AOS is not going to make a difference, uh, but I don't know if it's, a, if it's a true diminishing return. I think it's more of am I utilizing the AOS. Okay, hopefully that helps. We've got uh, a couple other questions here. Uh, is it true that that max degree of parallelism should be one, or is that a cop-out because determining the appropriate max top is hard? Okay. So this, so the max degree of parallelism, the setting one actually turns off the parallelizing. It's a suppression setting. Uh, I, I believe zero is the default, and zero is the auto configure. So the SQL server will actually try to figure out how many parallel uh, processes are going on at one time. And um, you know, I don't know the, the, the reasoning behind it, but everything I've seen from Microsoft when it comes related to AX is to have that maximum degree of parallelism set to one. You certainly you know, other systems that are using SQL Server, uh, they, you know, you potentially could have, have it set to, uh, I think it's related to the cores that are on there and how the process, the parallel processing works on the cores. Um, but with the Microsoft AX settings, it's, everything I've seen on that is recommended to be set to a one where it's suppressing that parallelism. Okay. Okay. Do we have time for one more, Steve? Sure. Okay. Um, we've got recommended, let's see. Actually, can we clear the GUID field while the dev or test environment is running? Okay. Um, so we, so it's, the GUID field is, a, is in the table. And so it's per environment. And, and so um, what you really want to do is, Ha you really want to shut down the AOS, go clear out the GUID, and restart the AOS. And what that's going to do is the AOS is actually going to go out there and see what the GUID is. And if it's all zeros, then it will recreate a new one. Um, so it's, it's, it's not going to, you're not going to get anything out of it if you change it in the middle of, you know, while the AOS is running. So the best thing to do is take, off, take down the AOS, Go change it in SQL, bring the AOS back up, and, and it should it should generate a new number for you. Okay, that was the last one, Kim. Anything else I think that came that's, in? That's, yep, that was it. That's all the questions that we have for today. Okay, so with with performance, it's not an easy thing. Remember, it's there's no silver bullet. It's a matter of checking the settings first, make sure that those are all good. If if you've got you feel like everything is good, the kernels matches, the settings are all good from what the recommendations are, and you're still experiencing some slowness. The next steps for you is to have a performance review. Someone who's been trained with the DynePerf tools or the performance analyzer tools um, and knows how to read the data that comes out of that, uh, get them in there and, and help them identify what's going on. Um, we certainly can help that. We've got you know 600 people in, in our organization and 120 of them are on the support side. Um, we've got some guys that that's all they do is go from company to company um, t t tuning their, their database. Um, any questions you guys may have, i got my contact information. It's uh, swalsh at hso.com. Um, and you can you know reach out to the, the folks here at Dynamics World, Jason at Dynamics World. If, if you want a copy of, of the slide deck, we'll certainly be happy to get these out to you. All right, well, with that, we will wrap things up. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your time and your attention today. And we did record today's event. There's also a very brief survey if you, uh, when you close out today. If you see that pop up, uh, take a few seconds to fill that out, and we really appreciate any uh, input you can share. But with that, uh, we are going to conclude today's event. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Seth.
Thank you.